Okay, we'll start with this. Very interesting matchup set to go down in the women's lightweight division later on this month for what is WBA interim status. Maida Moneo will be taking on Olympic gold medalist Estelle Mosley of France. In France. It appears that the amateur standout will have home field advantage in what is this lightweight contest, this WBA interim title fight for the chance to become the mandatory challenger to one of Katie Taylor's titles. Estelle Mosley sports a professional record of 11 wins with no losses, one draw, one knockout. Not a big puncher. Estelle is a fundamentally sound fighter, some athleticism there, and some speed, but not much in terms of power. I feel like that could be a problem for Estelle ahead of this fight opposite the ring. Mayra Moneo, who's a very aggressive fighter, a volume puncher. I wonder if Estelle can get Mayra Moneo's respect. Mayra Moneo, who sports a professional record of 13 wins with one loss, no draws, three knockouts. This is not a developmental fight or a bring a long fight, so you shouldn't think of it as one. There is a legitimate chance that Mayra Moneo could upset the apple cart for Estelle Mosley and give her her first professional loss. There is. Having already shared the ring with a former world champion in Erica Farias and a former world title challenger in Yamila Reynoso, Mayra Moneo is about as ready as she's going to be and she was very active last year. She fought four times last year and she's already seen action once this year compared to Estelle Mosley who only fought once last year but she has seen action at least two times this one neither fighter has any ring rust they need to shake off but that's basically saying that in the last two years Mayra Monel has been a lot busier a lot busier than Estelle Mosley the Olympic gold medalist and the amateur standout who is a, a fundamentally sound fighter but having seen many of her fights I just feel like she's missing something you can't say that her quality of competition is poor she's fought some good fighters Yanina Lescano Verena Kaiser Emma Gangara Emma's better than her record suggests I mean Estelle Mosley has given three unbeaten fighters their first professional losses though having seen her in action so many times I just feel feel like she's missing something, that she makes a better amateur than a professional, a better three-round fighter than a ten-round fighter. Shows good fundamentals, decent speed, decent athleticism, but nothing really jumps out at you about her. Whereas Mayra Moneo comparatively seems a little bit more settled into who she is as a fighter. What you see is what you get, and what you get is a very aggressive come-forward, mid-range to inside hooker, an aggressive one. She doesn't have the Olympic amateur pedal agree that Estelle Mosley has. But what she does have is fire. What she does have is spice, desire. And that in and of itself can go a long way in the pro ranks because this is not a three-round fight. This ain't the amateurs. In Maida, you get a gutting and gritty, durable fighter, whereas when it comes to Estelle, I have questions about how durable she really is, given what I saw in her last fight with Magali Rodriguez. Just so happens that Estelle Mosley shares one or two common opponents with Carolyn Dubois, yet another unbeaten up-and-comer in today's women's lightweight division. Share common opponents in Magali Rodriguez, who I just mentioned, Yanina Lescano of Argentina, and what I notice is Carolyn Dubois, she blew these fighters out of the water. Estelle didn't. Estelle Mosley, in spite of her Olympic gold medal and her amateur background, she is not dispatching these opponents in the same way that young Carolyn Dubois is, that while her quality of competition, it hasn't been bad, her performances leave something to be desired. Yeah. I think about the durability of Mayra Moneo, the aggressiveness, the volume, and I don't know that Estelle Mosley can keep her off or keep her out. I don't know that Estelle Mosley can stand up to a flush shot, a flush punch from Mayra Moneo when she was buckling. She was getting wobbled by Magali Rodriguez, and Magali's not a big puncher. Magali's volume, Magali's combination punching was flustering Estelle Mosley. So what's Myra's combination punching going to do to her? Best way to describe Estelle Mosley is a finesse fighter. And these finesse fighters tend to fall apart at the seams under pressure when they lack the punching power to get their opponent's respect. Myra moneo has got dog in her. She's got real dog, whereas Estelle... Maybe that's what she's missing, killer instincts. Estelle has skill, she has ability. It would be unfair to say that she doesn't, but I feel like what she's missing is dog. That spice and that spite 
to take it to the opponent, hurt the woman opposite the ring. I don't think she goes in there with the same intent, the same bad intentions of a Mayra Moneo. I was hot. And perhaps that's why we so often see these finesse fighting kind of fighters like Estelle Mosley buckle under the pressure of a pressure fighter, a volume puncher. First look. I think Estelle is gonna have her hands full on the 18th, and I'm not sure that she can stay an unbeaten fighter opposite the ring Mayra Moneo. Too gutting, too gritty. Estelle's looking for a boxing match. She wants to box, whereas a fighter like Myra, she wants to fight. I don't know that Estelle has enough fight in her to keep Myra off, to keep Myra out. We'll talk more about the fight as the fight date approaches. Elsewhere in the world of boxing, Coach Malachi Williams of New Media, great content creator here on YouTube, posted some insightful thoughts about Showtime's potential exit from the sport of boxing. Coach said, if all the Showtime pay-per-view fights were so successful as the mainstream media and pro PBC YouTube channels were reporting, then tell me why Showtime is dropping the PBC at the end of the year. This is proof that so-called pay-per-view stars that the public were being fed was a lie. That's why Showtime never released the pay-per-view numbers of their fights, because they were flops. It was all smoke and mirrors. It's a valid point to raise that if the pay-per-views and if the numbers were as successful as some people led you to believe, then why would Showtime be leaving? I said it before and I'll say it again. If Showtime and Paramount wanted to, if they wanted to, they would extend their deal with the PBC and give them a bigger budget the following year. If the numbers were good and the content was good, they wouldn't be walking away from the sport of boxing after 37 years. years They'd be going years, back for years. more. They'd bring up. Not walk away. So because they're walking away, that tells you what you need to know. That tells you that all this talk you've been seeing the last two, three, four, five years about the viewing figures at Showtime and the success of their fights, all of that was hot air. It was bullshit. Because that's the way these things work. When the content is good and the numbers are robust, the higher-ups are going to want more of that content. They're going to want to stay in the business. They're not going to walk away from it. I told you guys for a long time here on this channel that based on what the viewing figures were and how these things generally operate, this is not sustainable and Showtime Boxing may go the way of HBO Boxing. To that, Boxing Insider Rick Glacier stated, to those concerned about what Stefan Espinoza is going to do next now that Showtime is dropping boxing, keep this in mind. He didn't give a shit about you when he was dipping into your pocket every month with a lot of inferior pay-per-view shows. That should have been, at best, on regular cable. Remember, it's Stefan Espinoza's fault Showtime Boxing is being shut down and Rick makes a valid point. All of this is happening on his watch. He was the head of Showtime's boxing division, their boxing wing. He was the president of Showtime Sports. So when Showtime decides they're not gonna do sports anymore, what do they need you for? Now I don't know if he'll move into a different division, a different wing of Showtime's broadcast department. I don't know. I don't know if he'll be out on the street. I don't know if he'll be out of a job. I'm not rooting for the man to lose his job. I'm just telling you that could happen. That if you were the president of Showtime Sports and Showtime decides they're not going to do sports anymore, what do they need you for? We saw a concentrated effort in some circles, very small ones, on social media to defend Showtime's programming, their decisions, decision making, and the proliferation of pay-per-views that they were putting out, likely from individuals that don't even buy pay-per-views. What? The Hamanites. These guys that have got a whole lot of time in their day to argue about fights they don't even buy because they don't have day jobs. What? You heard what I said. Your opinions on pay-per-views that you don't even buy, purchases that you don't even purchase, don't fucking matter. You can love Al Heyman, you can love the PBC, but it really doesn't matter unless it shows up in the numbers. And the reason Showtime is walking away from boxing is because it hasn't been showing up in the numbers. Comprendo, friendo. It's not complex. Even someone with a mild understanding of how these things work would realize if the numbers were good, they wouldn't be walking away. But they're walking away because the numbers aren't good and you can't undo four and five years of bad decisions and bad metrics just because you're having a decent year this year at this point it's too little 
and it's too late. So now Heyman wants to go to Amazon. But his ability to deliver his broadcast partners big numbers has been less than spectacular. That's why so many broadcast partners walked away. You're talking about NBC. You're talking about Bounce. You're talking about Spike. You're talking about Fox and FS1. Now it's showtime. How do you convince Amazon to do business with you? When that's your track record, how do you do it? And we've talked about what Al Heyman might have to offer in a previous video, but what you have to ask yourself is, if Amazon were to actually do business with Al and they start showing PBC fights, what's the deal structure gonna look like? Are they gonna give him 50, 60 million to do fights annually? Are they gonna give him an annual budget? Do they wish to house all of the PBC's fighters or are they only interested in select fights, select fighters, select content like Canelo Alvarez fights or maybe Davis fights? You have to ask, what's the deal structure going to look like? Are they going to give him an annual budget? And is it even a good fit? Just because Amazon has over a hundred million subscribers, that doesn't mean over a hundred million of them are sports fans or boxing fans. What percentage of Amazon's subscriber base actually watches boxing matches? In previous years, the total number of subscribers to the Showtime platform hovered around either 33 million or 29 million, but less than 1%. If the average fight you do is anywhere in between, I don't know, 200,000 viewers to 400,000, your average fight, and that is your median number for a boxing show, for a boxing match. That's less than 1% of Showtime's overall subscriber base. Less than 1%. Those margins are the margins that now see Showtime leaving the sport after 37 years. Those numbers. So what are the numbers at Amazon gonna look like? You say that Amazon has over 100 million subscribers, 140, 150, whatever it is. Out of that 140 or 50, how many of them are boxing fans? How many of them are going to actually tune into boxing matches? It matters. If they were to go into business with Amazon, while they might find sanctuary, at least momentarily, the strength of the stable and the strength of the programming can only go so far because you don't have all the names, you don't have all the fighters, you can't put on all the big fights, you haven't monopolized the sport of boxing. You might have wanted to, but you're really just back at square one. Some of these fights the bigger ones would require you to work with other people so the politics haven't changed some of these fights at least some of them if what you're talking about is a Davis versus Stevenson fight or a Davis versus Lopez fight those fights would require you to work with top rank and ESPN so you can see how even if they were fortunate enough to go into business with Amazon a lot doesn't change and the problems are still the same they are I feel consolidation is best consolidation of promoters on a particular platform it may sound strange, but the PBC going to DAZN might be a little better than them going to Amazon because DAZN already has a robust boxing catalog. Anybody subscribed to DAZN is a sports fan, but not everybody subscribed to Amazon watches sports. No. May seem far-fetched and unrealistic, idealistic, but consolidation would be better than jumping into bed with a broadcaster that doesn't normally do sports, that doesn't normally do boxing. I don't expect them to, though. Not expecting the PBC to go to the zone. I'm just saying if they did, it might actually be a better fit because a good number of their subscribers are there for boxing. They're there for sports. We'll see what happens. We'll see where they go. If they go anywhere. Just in keeping with the theme of all things Showtime, assuming that Showtime stays in the Gervonta Davis business beyond this year, Gervonta's longtime trainer, Calvin Ford, had teased that a big fight is now in the works for Tank's return. Right now, something big is coming, I can tell you that. It's quiet for a reason. They're trying to seal the deal. It's going to make the world turn, and this is what he said on the Rise podcast a little over a week ago. Though, what exactly Calvin Ford's idea of being isn't this the guy who made empty promises about a Vasolo Machenko fight for years? It's hard to imagine who Gervonta Davis is going to face next while simultaneously keeping up appearances and keeping up the numbers. The big numbers that he just did with Ryan. Versus the state at the weight. I don't think it's 
Shakur Stevenson, Calvin Ford is talking about because he's booked to fight Edwin De Los Santos towards the end of this year. There were some rumors this past week about a potential Teofimo Lopez fight, but since then, we have confirmation. Confirmation on both sides, the Golden Boy side and the top rank side, that what they want to do early next year is put Teofimo in the ring with Ryan. So I don't think it's Teofimo Calvin's talking about. All Ryan has to do is take care of business with Oscar Duarte. And he may go straight into a Teofimo Lopez fight afterwards. Thus, I don't think it's Ryan he's talking about. I don't think it's Teofimo he's talking about. He can't be talking about an Isaac Cruz rematch because that's not big. You're not going to do a million with that. You're not going to do half a million with that. Or a Frank Martin fight. These are lesser known, even lesser known guys than Shakur Stevenson, than Devin Haney. You won't do a million with them. In order to keep up appearances, keep up this illusion that Javante Davis is any way on the verge of becoming the face of boxing, and he'll be able to keep up the numbers and keep up the trend in his very next fight, I feel like he'd have to fight an MMA fighter. I feel like he'd have to fight a Sean O'Malley or someone like that in a crossover fight, a circus fight. They're already claiming... Have you heard these guys? They're pretending that the only reason Gervonta Davis versus Ryan Garcia sold a million pay-per-view buys is because of Gervonta, that Ryan had nothing to do with that, his contribution, and yet Gervonta was in action earlier this year against Hector Garcia. He didn't sell a million buys with that fight, so why did he do that with this one? They're being obtuse. They're being childish and stupid. It's what they do when the statistics don't stack up the way they want them to, that Javante Davis had already been on pay-per-view five times prior to fighting Ryan Garcia, and he never cracked half a million buys, let alone a million, so clearly Ryan contributed something. Surely, but you can't fix stupid. You have to wonder what Javante Davis is going to do in his next fight, where will it be broadcasted if Showtime ends up leaving, and who will he end up fighting based on the state at the weight? You see Say you're planning something big, define big. What's big? Been patting yourselves on the back for years for what are mediocre numbers at the box office. 200,000, 250, not the year mark of a bona fide pay-per-view attraction, a star. If you go back to doing numbers like that, the jig is up. Cat's out the bag and we'll know the only reason that pay-per-view touched a million buys is because you had Ryan to help you sell it. You can't do numbers like that on your own. And if you have to fight an MMA fighter... If that's what you have to resort to to do some numbers... We'll see what happens. I don't have all that much stock in things that Calvin Ford says because he said they'd fight Vasil Lomachenko. And that never happened.